Already, the bay has lost 23 species, more than one third of the total identified since the first sampling. This spectacular run of sockeye salmon tells us that we've crossed North America from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, where the sockeye is one of six species of native Pacific salmon. Here, too, all species are in steep decline. And one of the latest dangers they face comes from imported Atlantic salmon, escaping from fish farms and aggressively competing with native stocks. In British Columbia, on the eastern side of Vancouver Island, is the salmon capital of the world. That's the claim. Not because of the numerous fish farms, but because in this area, the greatest tonnage of wild Pacific salmon, chum, chinook, coho, sockeye, and pink, was once caught. Over recent years, as catches collapsed, many fisheries were closed. Luckily, on the day of our arrival, there was frenzied activity because a pink salmon fishery had been open for a couple of days. When our float plane landed near one of the fishing boats, we found to our amazement that most of the catch was not native pink salmon, but alien Atlantics. Not one or two of them, but hundreds. The rest of the fleet was also catching them in thousands, according to messages reaching skipper Calvin Cedar. There are another predator fish out here that, that shouldn't be here. You know, if there's tens of thousands of them, that's hundreds of tons. Uh, you know, it's well documented around the world what the problems with fish farming is, and this is one of them, them escaping into the wild. Well, there's that one there with no nose. Nobody no. knows why that is. But the, the these, these fish too, didn't all come out of the same pens, you see. When, when they raise them to market size, they're all the same size. So these fish are either from two different farms or at least two different pens. What do you think is the ultimate danger of this? The total devastation of our wild stocks. I mean, our, our, our wild stocks in BC here could feed the world if it was treated properly, if we had salmon enhancement and, and good conservation, uh, you know, saving the, the habitat, stuff like that. We could feed the world with that. But the, as far as I'm concerned, these are pollution. I'm not anti-fish farm. I, I understand and realize that it's a an integral part of our economy in BC, but I'm anti-irresponsibility. And you reckon at the moment it's irresponsible? Absolute irresponsibility to have these swimming in the wild. As far as rules and regulations are concerned, the fish farm industries basically had carte blanche in, the, in BC in the last 15 years. They've gotten away with pretty well anything they've wanted to. They've released diseased fish you know, they're killing seals and sea lions all over the place. It's, it's like the, the Wild West kind of thing, attitude as far as they're concerned. They could not care less about the environment around them. It's all the almighty dollar. Once the news got out that the fleet was hauling in Atlantics, one farm admitted to the escape of 3,000 salmon and then another to 30,000. And Willie McIntosh knows all about escaped salmon. On the west coast of Scotland, farmed salmon also turn up in nets and at the end of the line. In some rivers where wild salmon are extinct, the only salmon now caught are escapees. Though farmers try to minimize the loss of their valuable fish, escapes continue. Net cages are damaged by storms and by predators but escapes are also due to incompetence. How many escaped fish survive in the wild is guesswork. But half Willie McIntosh's catch are escapees. And since he's the only netsman on the coast, there must be a considerable number that don't finish up in boxes. In this Norwegian river, escaped salmon mingle with wild fish, the former easily identifiable by their damaged tails and fins, frayed with contact with the cages. In some of Norway's traditional salmon rivers, farm salmon now outnumber wild breeders by three or four to one. Every river has its own race of wild salmon with a distinct genetic identity, but interbreeding with farm fish will destroy this uniqueness. That is one conclusion reached by Dr. Ian Fleming and his team. 
In a large-scale experiment, they tagged mature, farmed, and wild salmon and studied their interaction when they were released into this Norwegian river. All other salmon were excluded. It was quickly established that the wild and domesticated fish are interbreeding. It's often said that, you know, what's the problem? There's always been a genetic mixing of salmon in rivers. Does it really matter? That's a good question. And the answer is yes, it matters quite a bit. I don't think it'd be the end of salmon. We would have a new type of salmon, certainly. We would have like a, a feral dog rather than, a, than the wolf that we have in our environment. Basically, we're gonna have fish all looking the same. They're gonna be based on farm fish. The farm fish that have come in and interbred up and down the coast in Norway, throughout Scotland and Ireland, and over into Canada. That is a concern that we have basically end up with one form of fish in the end. And if that's the bad news, this is the nightmare. GM salmon. Aquaculturalists say that as long as the public don't want transgenics, they won't raise them. Yet they are a brilliant discovery, according to Dr. Garth Fletcher, who created them by stitching a gene from an ocean pout to a salmon growth hormone gene. His demonstration of their potential was impressive. These are two fish exactly the same age. They're, they're siblings. One's a transgenic, and one's a standard size, a standard salmon from the same family. And as you can see, one is, well, it's several fold bigger than that, at least twice as big as the other one. Uh, they were growing up in the same environment, fed the same food. Everything's the same. It's just that one, one goes faster than the other one does. It's fantastic, really. Put this one in first. Fantastic, yes. The rate of growth that's spectacular in adult fish is truly fantastic in the young transgenic salmon. The small dark fish in this tank started life at the same moment as their large, silvery, transgenic siblings. At this stage, they're growing five times faster. Let's talk about the environmental question. The idea that these fish could be grown in sea pens with the big problem of escapes, I think, is the one that has really worried people. How could you put their minds at rest? They should be sterile, and I think all farm salmon should be sterile. So this way you can't get uh, cross-hybridization with, with, with the wild stocks uh, at all. And uh, now I have to say, from the point of view of a corporate side of it, this is a no-brainer. You want them to be sterile so that nobody else can take your technology and use it for themselves. Once we go through the regulatory process of getting approval for these various uh, aspects of this product, uh, they, we will have to prove that they're always sterile. Have you been surprised at the press that you've been getting and Frankenstein's monster fish and right. all that? Has that surprised you? What's wrong with Frankenstein? I, I haven't got it yet, right? I mean, you could say the press considered me to be a clone of Dr. Frankenstein if you wish. I mean, I don't have a problem with this. The, the problem is really the reality to people. Is it safe to eat? And is it going to cause any more of an environmental problem than agriculture does today? Looking down the road 20 years from now, shall we all be eating genetically modified salmon? Well, I think it's your choice. 20 years, is, that's probably a reasonable time to say it's possible that many of the growers have taken on some of these technologies because they see that they need to reduce the price of fish even further than it is today. I mean, let's take our competition's chicken. You're talking six weeks to a chicken that shows up in the marketplace, six weeks from an egg. Well, salmon, two to three years, that's slow. Like all other intensively produced livestock, farm salmon grow bigger and faster because of the way they're reared and fed. And since, remember, they are carnivorous fish, the food pellets that rain down on those pens are made from other fish, wild fish. The factory farming of salmon is sustained by the industrial fishing of the oceans. Of all the 95 million tons of fish trawled worldwide, about one third is not for human consumption, but to make fish oil or fish meal for livestock. In the Atlantic, sand eels and capelin are two of the target species. More than 30% of all fish meal and 50% of fish oil is destined for aquaculture, much of it to feed salmon. The rest goes to poultry and pigs. It's often argued that harvesting these fish to feed other fish is wasteful and unsustainable. Between three and five kilos of wild fish are used to produce one kilo of salmon. But it's undeniable 
that the fatty acids in that salmon are good for us. It's one of its strongest selling points. The special thing with the Atlantic salmon is basically that it is a product known uh, by the consumer as a well-documented, safe and healthy product. And I think there is more and more concern today about uh, human health. And uh, from that perspective, the uh, Atlantic salmon contribute to improve the health status of the consumer. You can look at uh, the cardiovascular diseases. It's proven that it has an effect on that. It has a reduction on the, um, on the cholesterol level in the blood. And it is, in, in general, uh, strengthening the immune system. But there is a downside. Many of the fish species that go into a salmon's diet contain contaminants known as persistent organic pollutants. They're from industrial wastes and pesticides. And even though the manufacture of these chemicals has been curtailed, large residues survive in the environment, ending up in the ocean and in the food chain. Unfortunately, the harvesting of fish from the ocean to feed farmed salmon is bringing these toxins back to whence they came, back to us, according to a scientist funded by Greenpeace, Dr. Paul Johnston. There were a group of uh, chemicals that were very, very widely used and have been very, very widely released into the environment. The problem with these particular chemicals is they're very persistent. They don't break down in the environment to any significant degree. Um, they're very bioaccumulative, which means they'll tend to build up in the fatty tissues in the body. And uh, obviously, they're toxic. Um, if you build up enough of them, um, and there's some argument as to what uh, enough of them is, um, but there will be uh, toxicological problems associated with that. These farm salmon, just slaughtered at a processing plant, have been raised on feed produced by one of a handful of large companies, all buying their fish meal and fish oil from a limited number of sources around the world. But scientists are finding surprisingly high levels of contaminants in the feed, including pesticides, organochlorine, such as polychlorinated biphenyls, and flame retardants, known as polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Testing for these pollutants is complex and expensive. Dr. Michael Easton recently carried out a pilot study for Canada's David Suzuki Foundation. He analyzed four types of fish feed, four farmed salmon from different sources, and four wild Pacific salmon. Though the sample is small, it seems to confirm that contamination in farm fish comes from the feed. The results were very very clear. Farm fish and the feed that they were fed appeared to have a much higher um, level of contamination with respect to uh, PCBs, um, organochlorine pesticides, and polybrominated diphenyl ethers than, than did wild fish. In fact, it was, it was extremely noticeable, the difference. It's a function of how the feed is made. They're concentrating of these different uh, materials to produce high uh, protein diets for the fish and ultimately the uh, contaminants apparently get concentrated as well. Disturbingly high level of flame retardants were found as well as much higher levels of PCBs in the farmed fish compared with wild Pacific fish. However in this country wild salmon may be equally contaminated with these compounds known to affect the nervous system. PCBs we, to put it bluntly, they're a neural poison. They're a neural toxin. Not only are they neural toxic, which causes learning disabilities, but also they are immunotoxic. They cause depression of the immune system that enables you to catch colds and flus and infections much more easily than normal. And they also aid uh, in the production of cancer. These toxins are not only found in fish, they're present in minute amounts in virtually all food. But levels are 10 times greater in what are called oily fishes, including farm salmon, than in most other foodstuffs. Since consumption of farm salmon has increased threefold in recent years, frequent consumers could be acquiring most of their toxin intake from this source alone. A single portion of salmon is virtually harmless, but frequent consumption over time leads to an accumulation of contaminants, and the concentration is exaggerated in those